Welcome back to The Big Show. It's Alex Belfield talking to my favourite people and the biggest stars. And trust me, Penny Smith is definitely one of them. That makes me sound like I'm so enormous. How do you do it? You get up at like two o'clock in the morning to start your day? Two o'clock? That'd be ridiculous. I get up at four o'clock in the morning, uh, five days a week. You say Um, that as if four o'clock isn't ridiculous. It isn't as ridiculous at two. No, I, when, I fa- when I first started doing breakfast television, I was working at Sky and I got up at three. Three o'clock is the middle of the night. Four o'clock, do you know, there's about a month in the middle of the year when four o'clock in the morning, dawn has already broken. Dawn's little curly fingers have already risen over the, over the, over the horizon. No, and it's actually lovely. And you're out there, the dawn chorus is in full throttle. It's marvellous and everything's all right with the world. And the thing is, I've been in your dressing room and seen mm. all your private bits. Not that I'm your stalker. When I say your private bits, I'm talking about the half inch you've got at GMTV. Mm. It's not that glamorous, is it? No, it isn't. Bless them. They try their best. Uh, we, do, we are allowed to tart up our little hamster cages <laughs> by putting photographs of various people on the walls but yes no there isn't very much space sometimes when there's, sometimes when it's me and Claire Nazir in particular I have the uh, computer between uh, eight uh, quarter past eight and nine o'clock she has the computer before then uh, and then we move over and it depends and we've only got a little bit of uh, desk space as you've seen and uh, some of that desk space is taken up with a bit of wardrobe so we we shuffle about and we we kind of straddle the desk corner and and we look at our squashed clothes but no, it all works. It's actually, in a funny sort of way, I don't mind it. I look at those enormous dressing rooms at the BBC and there are days when I think, oh, lovely. But, you know, we, we get on well, so it's all nice. It's cosy. And you've been doing it long enough. Is there ever a point where you want to go from the news desk to the couch and become the proper presenter? <gasps> Can't believe you said that. I do the sofa between <laughs> six and seven, as you well know, with the gorgeous John Stapleton. I'm there with me stopwatch. Don't worry about that. No, no I'm yeah. talking about the bit of the programme that people actually watch. <gasps> Right, that's it. <laughs> right, here it is. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get this noose out now. I'm gonna rip your arms off and beat you to death with a soggy end. No, the news hour is a marvellous show. And actually we get a very good percentage. We get um no, we, we do very well with with our news hour. Stop bragging. I have seen it occasionally. When I'm going to airports <laughs> and things, occasionally I catch you and, and it is nice. Radio presenters don't generally like journalists because you always think I am you're... a journalist, you turnip. <laughs> I'm a journalist, I've been a journalist since I was eighteen. That's I what really I'm saying. Know. We don't like you because you think you're more important than we are yet we do most of the hour you get what i'm saying no i don't know what what earth you're talking about i put my time in i've done my i did my work i did my council meetings and those oh my goodness those endless council meetings it's so nice not to do them oh those moments when you used to get told you were doing a night job you used to trail off cambridge county council sitting there while they all blows and then at the end and you i don't know about you but do you have a problem with concentration you do. You see, I think uh, it's funny, you know, uh, can I mention the book after the break coming out in July? All good bookstores and uh, supermarkets. <laughs> and in after the break, Katie Fisher, the putative heroine, uh, is sitting there or standing there, in fact, take, trying to take instruction from these people. And all she's thinking is concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. And that's the only thing she can hear in her head. And, and I used to be sitting there thinking, concentrate, 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 concentrate. And I could even write shorthand whilst listening and thinking in my head, concentrate, concentrate. Look at this shorthand and think, I have no memory of them talking about that. I don't know. It's the weirdest thing. And we started in local radio together, both in the same place, Nottingham. You were at Radio Trent. Mm-hmm. No, don't forget, I started on Radio Hong Kong. Anyway, Is that because you couldn't get a proper job in the UK and you had to go abroad? Get a, couldn't get a proper job. No, it's because I left the <laughs> Peter Evening Telegraph to go backpacking around the world and I ran out of money. Then I had to get some more money, so Radio Hong Kong took me on. How are you doing over there? I mean, are you a big star? Oh, massive, massive, massive. Yeah, I can't, uh, I can barely get over there, but obviously because of my massive, st- <laughs> you know, essentially because I am massive, I couldn't get through the airport controls. No, um, uh, yeah, I have no idea. I haven't been back to Hong Kong since. Funny enough. Mm. I think a future on, you know, Hong Kong Breakfast TV is for you, really. Oh, wouldn't that be fab? I'd quite like to do that. They're awfully hot and sweaty in June and July, though. You spend an awful <laughs> lot of time in, in a lava, getting terribly hot, and then you go into the air conditioning and get terribly cold, all sort of, all your sweat. Not that, of course, I sweat, I merely glow, but the glow freezes <laughs> as soon as you go into air conditioning, and then, and then that's it, and you get a horrible cold for two months. I noticed the first thing you did when you came here was looked at me with discontent, as I understand most ladies do, and then you start playing with my air conditioning. What's wrong with it? Too cold. 
What do you like? It is too cold. Everywhere is too cold. I should really go and live in a very, very hot climate. I've had too many guests fall asleep because it's been too hot. I think that's the reason they've fallen asleep. We both know why they've <laughs> fallen asleep. We're going to talk about your days on the radio in a bit. And you mentioned your book earlier, which I was going to get to. Don't think I won't give yeah, you your plug. Yep, thank you. It's called After the Break. And basically, it seems to have a lot of similes, at least the first book did, with your life, which is based around TV. Did you say similes? Do you mean similarities? You said similes. I'm a presenter, you're a journalist and you're a pedant. I don't have to use the right words, you do. <laughs> don't start being clever with me or I'll take the plug a simile out. Simile and a metaphor, if you remember, a simile is when you say, you know, as thick as a whatever. Right, OK, help me with this. So simile means what? It's usually when you've got as something, as a something or other. And a metaphor is when it's something like you talk about foothills, despite the fact they've got nothing to do with feet. So uh, like a metaphor would be you're now becoming as annoying as somebody yeah. off pop idol something like that yeah that's a simile that's a simile yeah and a metaphor would be you're now getting on my nerves as much as no because you're back to similes again <laughs> as much as you see do you see what I mean it's a sort of as as see, I haven't got the hang of this have you really right. No. <laughs> thank you for helping with my English this is why I don't like journalists you see because you're all too smart and I'm just some daft I presenter no you see they, you've got it wrong the reason I became a journalist was A because I wasn't very good at anything else apart from English. And B, because I'm not very bright. I just rely on other people to say the right things. Or say the wrong things in my case to then correct me. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it's not that that's not difficult, is it? No, you could be here all day. So any other mistakes I've made that you'd like to correct at this point? Uh, not that I've noticed, you see. Generally, it's about grammar as well. People doing aberrant apostrophes. I'm sorry, when I say doing, that was the wrong choice of words, you see. That's the problem. One can be hoist by one's own petard. I love things like that. Hoist by your own petard. People think it's something to do with, you know, hoist by your own you know, clothing or something. When in fact, a petard is, now I think I've got this correct, but a petard is something that sets off uh, a bomb. So, for example, there would have been a petard used during Guy Fawkes, Fawkes when he tried to blow up the, the House of Parliament. And so to be hoist by your own petard was when actually you'd sort of set the petard on fire and then actually blew yourself up rather than blowing up the object that you were trying to blow up. And apparently posh does not mean port out starboard home. I can't remember what it is. I've got. I've been given um, the, the pedant's guide to sayings, as in you know the ones that are that people think are what they are, but which actually aren't. I've forgotten. There's, there's, not, there's, well, there's a whole book about them. And that's posh, is it? Posh was a, a people think that it's posh out, uh, port out, starboard home, um, to do with trips to New York, but it doesn't work in so many ways. You see, I'm so thick. I thought posh meant very, very thin. Yeah, she is now, isn't she? But she never was. Do you know, there I was at the O2 yesterday watching the, uh, having a look at the British music experience and there was a... Uh, then it goes through all the years and everything so you can spend happy hours going, oh, I loved that time in my life or whatever. <laughs> or I hated it then, I was being bullied. Um, and there's a, a, there's a the, the four dresses that they wore, that the, um, that the Spice Girls wore. Yeah, quite interesting. Hmm. Did yeah. you try and get into any of them? Oh, yeah, that'd be quite interesting, wouldn't it? No, no, but the skinniest one, in fact, was Mel C. Hmm. Or, or it looked like the skinniest one. It's a bit difficult because they're all on models. And it's surprising how many of the stars of uh, yesteryear were incredibly either tiny or slim. Freddie Mercury, barely bigger than a hamster. And, of course, Mel B, I was just talking to in Las Vegas in her new show, Peep Show, where she doesn't wear anything. Well, she wears a little bit of something, doesn't she? Well, it's... It looks like she's not wearing anything. Mm. Marvellous. Anyway, mm. are we ever going to get you topless? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't see that one coming, did you? No, I didn't. But yeah, the lively, I can, people, I can hear people switching off all over the place. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think topless and singing it could be your forte, mm. because, I mean, we saw that, didn't we, the on the BBC? The people would be able to cope with it, isn't it, really? <laughs> Why did you do that dreadful programme where they humiliated you? Oh, did they? Do you think they humiliated? Sorry, me? no. I you you humiliated did. yourself. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think I did it all on my own. So. Um, well, I think it's like all these things. You think that? I mean, I. They did test me beforehand, and I can <laughs> sing in tune. They did check, and I used to be a chorister. The thing is, that singing with a microphone is different. Uh, I should have done karaoke. And then I would have been used to the fact that you can hear yourself coming back out of the speaker hearing you hear yourself differently and you keep on saying I'm singing out of tune because in your head you're singing in tune but out of the speaker it sounds like you're singing out of tune and so then I was trying to change the way that it was coming out of the speakers which was making me sound flat 
I didn't get the hang of it until virtually I was kicked off. Uh, I had to almost, I made it to the quarterfinals, so being the underdog, it was marvellous. And I've made a friend for life in Curtis Stigers, mm. who is one of my favourite men of all time. He's gorgeous, handsome, and it's a shame he's got a wife and child, but anyway... You can't have everything, can you? What I do think that show did for you was make us realise even more that you're a funny person and a real person, Mm. and most journalists aren't. They try and be aloof and better than we are. I think if you said Penny Smith to most people, they'd say, oh, she's nice, and I think that's the greatest compliment. Oh, nice. Well, I'm not sure I quite like that epithet. Do you? Well, well, all nice. right. Nice means nothing. But all nice. right, let me rephrase oh, it. Yeah, that's, you know, that's the sort of the word that I use when I go, oh, yeah, no, they're, they're nice. And then and you can tell that people are going, oh, no, they're that dull. All right, let me let me backtrack <laughs> from that. You've got a personality and you're funny and you're different. Do you know what I mean to most journalists who try and be toffee nose? Oh, I don't think they do. I think you've just met some dodgy ones, love. I think you should go out and meet some other. I've got loads of lovely journalist friends. I don't like journalists. Oh, I'm not well, wasting I mean, my time. You've got a chip on your shoulder. Well, I mean, they do what you do. You make me look stupid by correcting me and pick yeah. up on all my many mistakes. Yeah, but that's isn't that life? For goodness' sake, <laughs> people pick on me. You just have to rise to the occasion. Look, I, you couldn't look more foolish than me on that. Just a just. I was just about to say just a minute on just the two of us. <laughs> Could I? You didn't do bad. You were all right, and everybody loved you. And that's the thing about it. Now, this book. Before you interrupted me, I was going to give you a plug. Do you want a plug for your book or oh, not? Oh, go on then. Give me one. Well, there's an offer. <laughs> After the breaks in your stores from August 3rd and uh, it's it's a book basically oh no, August the 3rd that's they what it says here July. no <gasps> August the 3rd no I'm getting later and later 2010 it says <laughs> <laughs> oh no well the thing is as long as it paid you for it already don't worry yeah they have and they pay and they but they pay you a bit more if you do well why did you want to do this type of writing instead of news stories I've always wanted to write uh, well, I, obviously I did write when I was writing on a newspaper and then I wrote my own scripts on the uh, uh, radio and generally on Sky. Um, but no, I wanted to... I've always wanted to write and I suppose the only thing that stopped me from writing was the fear of failure. And I wished I didn't have that because I think I've had it ever since I was knee-high to a flea. I have been scared of failing and it's a horrible, horrible thing to do. It's weird, isn't it? Why would you feel like that, though? Because you're eloquent, you're pretty, obviously people like you, you're warm. There's no reason why you would fail at anything. You've got everything going for you. It would only be your own lack of confidence that would make that happen. Well, that was, that's it then, isn't it? You've just answered the question, thanks. Well, we don't need to go any further. What is it? Your parents, your brothers, your sisters? Were you bullied? I think yes, was I bullied? I think having an older brother actually who beat me at everything uh, because he was two years older and he beat me at chess and he beat me at Scrabble and he beat me at Monopoly and he beat me at this and he beat me at that. He was faster. He was better. uh, There was nothing I was better at than than he was, and um, that makes it. I, I think that is maybe that's it. I don't know. I have no idea. All I know is the fact that fear of failure is a horrible, horrible thing, and I should have had it beaten out of me at a very early stage. Not, and that you see is metaphorically. I didn't want it. Okay, do you understand that metaphor? I didn't want it literally beaten out of me because that would be really, really unkind, mm. and it would have been painful. And similarly, I feel the same way. Similarly, as opposed to a simile. There you are. Did I get that right? Yes, you did, yeah. You said similarly, and earlier on you said simile. Now, I have a problem with the word necessarily. If I don't concentrate, I say necessarily. Every time. (laughs) And I hear, can hear myself saying it. And of course, it doesn't look good, particularly if you try to do a serious interview. Yes, Minister, but that isn't necessarily true, is it? And you just see yourself saying it. What is your biggest cock up? And what is the thing that if you could edit out of your past, you would take away? I, I always like to make my guests feel good about themselves. Yeah, no, that, there's so many. I can't remember. They're, they're just every single. I, I can't think of a day when I go, that was a perfect broadcast. Oh, God, I was good today. I never think that. I always think, why did I say that? Or, oh, that's so irritating. Why did I do that? Or I laughed in some in a, in a place that was inappropriate, or I stumbled or stuttered, or, oof, generally, no. I've made it clear during this interview I don't like journalists, but I do have a lot of respect for TV news journalists because you've got so much going on. I mean, I'm just sat here looking at you, talking to you with no distraction and I can barely cope. You've got the guys in your ear, you've got film that can go down, you've got guests that come in at the wrong time, you've got two presenters who are chit-chatting, a weather presenter who walks in front of you. There's so much to go wrong and you're there and you've got to deal with it. Mm. How do you do that? 
experience. I think right at the beginning, when you make all your serious cock-ups, you hope that you're doing it all on... Um, I don't know, this is going to sound awful, but you do, do it on local television. Um, and we used to, and when I started in television, it was a boarded television, and so many things used to go wrong. The auto queue used to go into Swahili. We used to <laughs> <laughs> things used to go things used to go wrong with such uh, regularity that it's why to this day, even though auto queue is generally much more uh, t- tends not to do these weird things. Uh, generally, things are much better, but it's why I always have my scripts, and I am obsessive about having my scripts in front of me and trying to get the and also uh, having the computer there just for backup all my backup bits it seems like at GMTV it's slightly easier to ad lib if something goes wrong because that's a feel of the program am I right in thinking that yes you are yes it's much easier to do that than I mean I, I do think sometimes you can watch people and you think oh that was a bit um, um, that, that particularly it wasn't a particularly a good way of getting out of things but then I do th- uh, but there's also uh, because we're three and a half hours of live show as you say things go wrong we've got lots of uh, we have people all over the shop we have as you say guests coming in and out all the time and perhaps on other shows it's a little less you know it's not quite as normal for, for things to go wrong so therefore they don't have the practice because that's the point we have a lot of practice about things going wrong we have a lot of a lot of times when we say we apologize for this we're sorry about that uh, that was supposed to be this but it didn't turn out to be that etc 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 do you have any great desire to one day be the anchor of news at 10 because i mean you've got the look now let's mm. face it you've got to be quite mm. good looking to be a tv presenter these days of news i'm not getting the gig am i Oh, bless you, you're a very handsome man. I don't know whether... Have, have, have your listeners had a description of you? I don't think it's necessary. Well, it's kind of Brad Pitt, really, I'd say. It's Brad Pitt looking gorgeous in a really snappy suit, pink shirt, and a particularly attractive... What What exactly is that? Is that some sort of codpiece? I don't know. Uh, sort of have you cod- been to Specsavers recently? Of, but I don't think there's anything wrong with... I think you should apply... Get on there and apply. I don't know if there's a vacancy, but get in there. I like personalities, and you're one of them. And you've got this new book, <laughs> After the Breaks in Your Stalls, at some point between now and 2012. Mm, mm, mm. 2020, I think. I've just looked at it. 2020, or is that my eyesight? It doesn't make any difference. As long as you've been paid, that's no, the most no. important thing. No, it isn't. I want people to enjoy it. And it, there's a little bit of romance. Uh, I can see quite clearly that you haven't read the book. Uh, there are no thumbed pages. Nothing is turned down on the corners. Do you not like this sort of book? Yes, I do. It was interesting, but it's a girly book, and I'll be honest with you. If you want a good book, and the last one, I did read that, Mm. because I was meant to talk to you then. I think you turned me down because I wasn't important Uh, enough. Yeah, yeah, no, snubbed you. Snubbed, Mm. snubbed, snubbed, yep. Mm. Probably you want to... You see, the thing is, I normally sleep at this time of day. You're lucky. You've caught me on a day when I'm having lunch with the girlies. Uh-huh. I won't be in a fit state later on. I did actually mention that to um, uh, when I spoke earlier on, uh, before we got on air, obviously. I said, I'm not doing the afternoon, love. I will have consumed a cocktail or two. Uh, so normally at this time of day, I'm sleeping. Where do we go? Somewhere showbiz or are we more McDonald's? Uh, I'm afraid I don't do fast food, really. Um, I can't remember the last time I ate a burger. That's why you're thin and gorgeous, you no, see. thin. Oh, I love you. Oh thin who's he talking to uh no i don't i don't do fast food and i i I don't know i do go to places that you would consider to be celebrity i do i have been to the ivy um and uh i am going to nobu today Uh but that's not my choice and i was noticing that was in the top 10 restaurants in the world last week wasn't it is it i'm a bit worried about the bill Mm. i'm going with girlies who've got uh, a lot more of the readies than me and i'm a bit worried i thought i might actually set out my stall beforehand and say right girlies I am on a credit crunch at the moment. Generally, I eat baked potatoes with baked beans. And so stop ordering anything expensive. We're not having that. We're not having that. We're not having that. I can't imagine you'll get much change out of a couple of hundred quid for an afternoon's oh, entertainment. Don't, honestly. That makes me feel a bit queasy when mm. I could buy another couple of pairs of shoes for that. And if you're anything like me, you'll probably then need a sandwich afterwards as well. Oh, <laughs> I hate places where they, I hate places where I go out hungry. No, it's terrible, actually. I spend my entire time thinking, do you know what? I could have... I could have got a top for that. Yeah, I would almost ex- exist entirely on soup. Given yeah. <laughs> soup and shoes. <laughs> soup and shoes, exactly. <laughs> soup, shoes and a top from Top Shop. Listen, we better go because you've got friends to meet and I've got to sit oh, here yeah. and, and, and think more about you. Penny Smith's new book <laughs> after the break is in your store some point this year. I think around August the 3rd. Yeah.
Well, just go, just go, keep going and asking. When's that book coming in? It's and excellent. You're very talented and you're very good and you're very gorgeous. And thank you, uh, thank you for being you because we need more personality journalists who aren't annoying and no more criticising me. I know I'm stupid and make mistakes, but it's not my fault. It was my I education. I didn't criticise you. I didn't say you were stupid. Why do you think you're stupid? I, I, so no I backtracking. I think you need to go and have. I think you need help. Stop backtracking. You were the one who criticised. I didn't criticise. You're I not even aware you, you criticised. I didn't even say you were thick. I just said I don't think you're aware of the fact that you just said simile instead of similarly. <laughs> Listen, I'd want people to say, did you know that you said necessarily? Oh, and also... Oh, no, it's OK. Come on, come on. More of you. More of your mistakes. And no, I was going to say that. No, I, I used to mispronounce words. I still mispronounce words. I used to say naive instead of naive. My big one was saying ubiquitous. For years I said ubiquitous until somebody said, I presume you mean ubiquitous. And I said, oh, is that how you pronounce it? I didn't know. I heard a local radio DJ the other day talking about the epitome of something. Yes, the epitome. <laughs> and what did somebody do the other day? And I went, and I said, no, you, don't, you don't use Oh, I know. All, all, albate. Instead of albeit, <laughs> no, you know, things happen. And it's, it's quite nice. And I used to think it was disheveled instead of dishevelled. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what's wrong with that? Distaste. You don't say, you know, you don't suddenly change it just because it's got an H after it. You know, loads of words. It's, not, it's fine. Go and have something to eat with your friends. Thank you for yeah. talking to me. You're I delicious. Fry, I call them fries. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Could you do a quick jingle? I'm Penny Smith listening to Alex Belfield. Okay. Uh, he's got big man boobs or something. Uh, okay. I'm Penny Smith listening to Alex Belfield. Yes, the Alex Belfield. Oh. Thank you.